picking up on the last workshop, I'm going to go through how to clean up our view templates for our site plan. It won't be definitive, but it will show you the workflow to continue on with when uh, resolving what your site plan needs to entail in, compl in, uh, in its um, completeness. So the one thing to remember with, um, with view templates is that if I want to know what object needs to be hidden and I can't remember what, for instance, where I might find it, remember to click on the item and in the properties window underneath of the type selector will be the category. So these red dash lines, they're reference planes. So I need to find reference planes under visibility graphics. So I open up visibility graphics and it's a annotation category because I can't see that line in 3D. That's how I know it's an annotation based object. And then I just go and find reference lines, reference planes and reference points. They're reference planes, but I turn off the other two just for good practice. Click on that immediately, they disappear. Next up, um, I uh, depends if we want to see section markers or not. Um, let me just double check. So some projects, they like to show section markers in a roof plan or a site plan. Others, they do not. I think I'll probably get rid of it, but I'll show you how to bring them back otherwise. Same with even the elevation markers. These are all um, annotation. So I click on them. That's a view. Click on this, that's an elevation. I think if I click on the arrow, if on the head of the section, we'll find them. So we go annotation, we go section, there they are, sections, I can turn them off. Elevations, there they are, turn those off. So that cleans that up. I've got to get rid of my project base point and survey point. I had that turned on from last time. So they're gone. So already the site plan's looking a lot cleaner. Next up, how do we show the contour lines on the um, topography? I need to go to massing and site and click on the little arrow next to model site. And I need to bring this site settings window up. And I'm gonna change this increment of showing additional contours. Um, let's just change it to say like show at every 100 mil and then click okay. And now we see those contour lines on our site. We can tag those contours as well. If I just click on label contours, um, what I do is I go from top to bottom. So let's say I want to go from this point up to the top of the site. If I click there, it will place contour markers. You can see along each of those lines pretty well. And then I could do another one on the other side like so. Or if I just want them on the edges, what I'll do is I'll isolate my site, go label contours, and I'll just click as close to the edge as possible and run it up to somewhere around here like that and do the same thing on the other side. like so. So they'll appear like that. It's up to you how you want them to look personally. Uh, it depends on how much information we've got on the sheet, but I'm going to do one somewhere around here and another one somewhere around here. And that's how we get our contour markers. All right. Then next up, um, spot elevations for our roof um, and whatnot. So Elevations, uh, and this goes. The, this is the same thing for um, for elevation drawings as well. So if I go to annotate and then go, to, where are we? Under dimensions, you have spot elevation. And when I click on that, it actually picks up the height of whatever I'm currently hovering over. So say the parapet top is 139.010. And when I hover down on the ground, you can see it's picking up the actual height of the fall of the site. As I move this along, it reports in real time. So you've got plenty of different ones here. You have, there's, there's a ton in here. You have target, project, target relative, target with leader, no symbol, beam elevation, crosshairs, etc. I'm just gonna pick on target project. Okay, and I'll just click here. And so it will allow me to do like a leader if I want to, something like that. Or I can click on it and I can get rid of the leader as well. And it will appear something like that. Now you want them most likely to show with a 
um, with a triangle or sometimes with just RL as a um, pretext with a with a crosshair with a with an X. So if we want that one, I'm going to click on this one here and go crosshairs project, and it will look something like this. But the crosshairs are sign, kind of like a plus button at the moment. So I'm going to go into this um, type and go edit, and let's rename it. Um, and I'm just going to rename it with uh, my initials, just so I can identify easily which ones I'm, I've edited. So let's go through here. Picks up the project base point. That's fine. Text size should be like everything else. 1.8 mil. Um, and then where are we? Prefix. We're looking for a prefix. Elevation indicator is prefix. Let's try RL dot and then say OK. There we go. So we now have RL dot and then the dimension and the text is much smaller. Uh, and we can move this around as well, like so. That's how we get our RLs um, showing. And you can see that that's got an opaque text background as well. That's why um, the text or the hatching in the roof is um, blocked out. Let's go back in there and see what else we can edit. So the symbol is an elevation crosshair. There are many different types. So if we want to edit these, and these, this is where... Um, these start getting a little bit more complex. So say that crosshair there, spot elevation crosshair. I need to go find that in my properties, in my um, project browser. So under families, it'll be an annotation symbol. And I think it was called, what was it called again? Damn it, I forgot. Um, let me just double check. Spot elevation. There it is. Spot Elevation Crosshairs, and I can right click on it and say Edit. And I'm going to make sure I bring everything up. Okay, there we are. And that's all it is, it's just two lines. So I can click on that and rotate that, say 45 degrees to give us the X. And what are they? Spot Elevation Symbols, okay. So from here, I can just go load into project. Do I want to save this? Nah. Do I want to override? Yes, I do. Whoops. Okay, so that's updated like so. What I will do though, is I'm just gonna pick up on that uh, spot elevation again, crosshair, go right click and go edit. I'm just gonna make that smaller. So, I love how it's in inches. I'm just using the mirror tool just to make sure they're all in proportion. There we are. And I'll load that back into the project. Okay, there we are. So that's how it looks. So I can continue to use this spot elevation. So I can go spot elevation, pick up on uh, PM underscore crosshair. So I know that's the one. And no matter where I hover over now, it's going to report back to me what that height is. So take over the garage. That's the height. And it does have a, um, if I need a uh, leader, I can put that in and it'll appear like that. Or I can say, actually, uh, I don't want the leader and it's going to appear like that. And if I want to move um, the text to the other side of the X, I can do so just by going like that. So that's how you do spot elevations. The next one is the actual um, tagging of the roof material. So if I just go TG on my keyboard to tag the roof and click, it's going to ask me um, to load a roof tag because there isn't currently one. I can say OK. And I've got to go back, back and go uh, into my library, Australian um, Family Library, Annotation, Tags, Architectural, and then look for Roof. Where is there one? Oh, it might be Structural. Structural. So I can't find the Roof tag by default in here, but that's actually a really good thing. So I'll show you a, a different way of creating tags. I'm gonna click on the Floor tag Okay, and then go open. So it's going to open up. That's fine. 
Oh, actually, no, I'm going to open up a new family. So I'm going to go f uh, file, new family, and then go annotation. And that's right, in here I can't see a roof tag, which is very bizarre. Um, but I'll just click on, say, um, where are we? Annotations. Okay, generic tag. Okay, and then I'll say open. And then while I'm in here, we can then place whatever we like. So this is good. This is how we create custom tags. So I'm going to click on this and delete that note. Go to create and then label and then just go click. And then it's going to ask me what data do I want to grab from the model. And in this case, I want to grab the type mark. So I bring that across and I might just give that RF XX for roof type and go OK. All right, so it looks something like this, but I have to edit this label. So I'm going to edit this, rename it 1.8 millimeter, change the size of the text to 1.8. Uh, it's opaque. Yep, thank you. So that looks good. I'll put that somewhere around the middle like so. Bring that back a bit. Then what we have to do is go up to this area here with the yellow um, folder. And this is where we change the category of model that it's picking up on. So if I then come down to roofs, roof tag, and then go OK, that will now pick up the type mark from a roof category. So it depends on how we want it to look. So if we look at a couple of references here, you can see this is just in a box. Um, some other ones might be in... Um, might be in like uh, ellipses or something like that, but let's just do ours similar, like in a box. I'm gonna go create masking region and I'm just gonna draw a box, do something like that. And I'm gonna change this label to not be opaque, but to be transparent because the white, the box is white, it's gonna provide us that, um, that uh, blackout or that white out. And what I'm doing now is just dimensioning this to make sure it's the right size or consistent size. So I'll make that 4.5 and click on this line, make it 4.5. I can delete those dimensions and now that's done. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go file, save as family. I'll just save this on uh, in my class for today and I'm going to call this an annotation tag underscore roof okay Let's save and then load into project and close and it will look like nothing's happened but you'll see now when I hover over the roof it, that that um, box has appeared and when I click on that the question mark appears so at the moment this roof does not have a um, type associated to it so I can give this um, the, I'll give this the same um, code as the roof tile so T F R O one so click on the tag T F R O one yep I'll change that so now I've got that tag for the roof type. I can move that around just by clicking on the grip. So I might put one there and I might want another one. So I'll grab that and I'll drag that over here onto this roof. And I might want to tag again and just put it up here just so I've got it denoted a few times. So that's how you tag your roof types. Um, we've done our property boundary and our bearing distance, uh, sorry, our, our site boundary and um, distance bearings. Um, after that, taking a look at the slope of the roof. So we've gone through like um, spot elevations, but we can now go through spot slope. So when I click on that, you'll see that an arrow appears that gives us the slope of the roof, but it's in a, a fractional system. So I'm just going to click once there and I'll click once there, once there, something like that. And we can edit this. So let's click on this family and it's just called spot slopes slope. I'm going to click edit type and rename it and we'll call this one angle. 
Okay, so the arrowhead is 30 degree fill. That's fine. So the, again, similar to like dimensions, the first part is about the graphics of the of the um, spot slope and the second component is about the text. So um, the line weight zero, it's a 30 degree arrow. Let's change that to a 15 degree filled arrow. Um, the slope direction is down. The leader length is 25 mil. I don't know, let's just make that 15 mil. And then underneath of that's the um, text size. We'll make that 1.8. Offset from leader is 1.5. Let's make that 0 0.3. Um, it's opaque. It's Arial and the units format. Let's click on that. And let's change that to a decimal degrees. And uh, unit symbol, we'll use the degree symbol. And we'll say OK. And let's click apply. And you can see that's now updated. That looks good. And there's no prefix, anything like that. That's done. And now you can see these other ones have updated. And if you're not happy with um, the uh, length of that arrow, I'll just go back into there and I might change that from 15 to 10 mil. And that's what our spot elevations look like. Again, very powerful tool. And you'll notice so far, we haven't actually used any dumb text. We're pulling real information out of this model. And much like with all the other assignments, it, it's always going to take longer the first time because we're editing these families as we go. But after this project's completed and you're using this file next year, there'll be no need to create any of this. It will all be embedded in the file already for you to use. few other workflows and adjustments for you to consider as you're working through your site plan and building that up. The first thing is that I want to turn this CAD drawing um, to or the, the CAD import to show these roof lines um, and the overhangs as dash lines. When I bring in CAD lines, they all sort of turn into a solid CAD, um, a, a solid, um, solid line. So what I've done is inside of um, the AutoCAD file, I've selected all of the um, overhang lines and made a new layer and put them as a site underscore dash layer. So that way I can select them independent of everything else. So with that in mind, I've reloaded it back into the project. And if I query one of those lines, you'll see that comes in a site underscore dash. Now I don't want to hide it in view, but I do want to manipulate it. So I'm going to go VV on my keyboard or VG, go to my import categories, find my dash line underneath the um, imported DWG and where it says lines override, I click on that and I just change the pattern to a dash line that I like. And in this instance, I'm going to use dash tight and then the color, I'm just going to stick with a, a dark gray like so and then say OK and OK and you can see those um, roof overhangs um, have now gone dashed. The next thing is I want to change the property line and how that appears. That is not under visibility graphics. I am going to go to the manage tab and go to object styles. And so object styles is a little bit confusing. We'll touch on this later on in the course, but object styles is kind of like the master way that objects will appear or elements will appear in the file. So um, property lines are three dimensional lines. So I'm going to go to down to site and go down to site, press the plus button and then property lines. So I'm going to make them much thicker. I'm going to make that a pen weight six and I'm going to turn that into like a purple line. And I'm going to see if I can find, can I find a property? There's a lot of lines in here. I want to find um, dash dot dash. or just da dash dot. Okay, let's try that dash dot um, with a line weight of six with a like a, um, a lavender sort of color. So, okay. And now that's updated. That's not bad, but I reckon I would probably still make the boundary line even thicker than that. So I'll go back to object styles. Let's do that again. So site, press the plus button, property lines, I'll make that a thicker line weight, maybe make that nine. Say so, okay. There we go. Now I think that's actually too thick. All 
Okay, that's fine. All right, so that's our property lines. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of other um, text that I've put on here. This is just standard um, just standard annotations inside of Revit. So, um, underneath the annotate tab, I've got the text tool, which is basically smack bang in the middle. Um, all the shortcut is TX. And when you click on that, you've got all your different text styles that we've created um, underneath the property type selector, including Arial 1.8, which is what I'm using majority of the time, plus a bit of 2.5 and even 3.5. And then that's for my um, street names and for the dwellings next door. But stuff like you know, private open space, carport, iron shed, all the rest of it, that's all just generic text, nothing too special there, including the property title as well. That's just dumb text at this point. Um, once we get more information, we'll stick this in. So we're going to have a driveway somewhere around here. The crossover is used to be over here, but it's going to have to be switched over here. We'll, so we'll need to do a little bit of work there. And the trees as well at the moment, um, there may need to be a little bit of work there. So we'll end up hiding these trees and bringing in our own 2D families as well to put over the top. Um, but that will sort of just take a little bit more time. So the one constant you need to remember is that you're always building this up. This um, You'll continue to add more and more information as we go along. We've got no information about gutters, about drainage paths, anything like that. One thing that I will add really quickly are just a couple of dimensions. So I know that um, if I go into the AutoCAD file, I've got this dimension here from the house to the boundary and then another dimension that's nine meters from this corner of the house to the boundary. And notice that there are meters, not in millimeters. And that's fine. I'll show you how to do that as well. So go back into Revit. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to use a detail line. So this is a two dimensional line. It's basically like a CAD line. So by default, underneath the annotate tab, you'll find it under the detail um, section pane in the ribbon uh, detail line. So I click on that. And that brings up like a sketch palette with all of sort of these predetermined pens. And you'll see some of these are typical like in AutoCAD, like pen um, 1.8, 3.5, stuff like, stuff like that. So I'm just going to take a pen 10 and um, I'm just going to copy. I'm just going to hover over this line and click and then take that line. And then I'm actually going to move it up to here. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I need the um, dimension to be aligned. So that line is on a different angle to the boundary and I need that in order to dimension. Because if I go and dimension from this line here, I won't be able to dimension this line because they're not parallel. So that's why I've got this line here that I've copied. So when I click on that, I get a dimension, which is 9,024. So I'll just go like that. And then I'll do that again for this over here. So DL on my keyboard, I'm going to click here once, press tab so it picks up on the on the line, click again, and then I'm just going to select that line, MV for move, and then just move this over in parallel to the boundary. Again, because that line's thin, you're not going to see it through that um, thicker boundary line. DI for dimension, click once, click twice. That's our setback from the boundary. Okay, so then how do I turn these into um, uh, how do I turn these into uh, meter dimensions? So actually, just quickly, I'm going to get rid of that because I want to actually dimension this slightly differently. That one is straight, so I'm going to go from the corner, from there to there. Mm, not even. like that. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I've got a couple of dimensions over here as well. I'm just going to click on this dimension type, which is the one that we edited way back when, I think in class two or three. Um, I'm going to go edit type and then duplicate and leave it as Arial 1.8 and then have dash meters. Okay, and then what I'll do is I'll come down to here where it says units format and I'm going to untick this. It says use project settings and change this to meters and we'll use it to one decimal place. So I'll say OK and OK and that updates now to 9.1 and what I might do is I'll actually have meters after that. So I'll come down to here and then say alternative, uh, sorry, I want a prefix. Um, 
alternative unit. Oh, what am I doing? I can just add it in here. I can just double click on it and then do a suffix M for meters. Like so. Yep. And I'll do the same thing here. I'll change this to meters 2.4 double click M for our suffix and these two as well. I'll change those to meters. All right, next I'm gonna add a, um, an easement line because we have a um, easement on our property, which is 1.83. So what I'm going to do is go detail line, DL. I'm gonna find a dash line. So I'll come down to where it says dash 0.25. And then I'm going to use this pick lines tool. So I'm gonna click on that. And then I'm gonna type in an offset of 1830. And then just hover over that back property line and click and that's how I get that dash line and then I'm just going to use my text tool so I can even just copy this text and then I'll make sure I write in caps for this one 1.83 meter wide easement like so Okay, and then the last thing we're going to do is just add some field regions over the um, neighboring properties as well. So to do that, a field region is also in the detail, in the annotate tab, in the detail palette, in the ribbon, and it's called region. And so you have field region and masking region. We went through masking region briefly back when we were doing our floor plans, but I'm going to click on field region, and this is essentially hatch for Revit. So we're going to click on where it says solid black. I'm going to go edit type and I'm going to duplicate that. I'm going to call this one gray underscore transparent. So the fill is solid. The foreground pattern is going to be like a, a light gray. And in fact, I'll make that probably even lighter. I might go to 220, 220, 220, and then I'll say, is it masking? No. Okay. And then there's, that's okay. That's done. Yep. Brilliant. So it's not masking. So I'll say, okay. And now what I can do is I can just use the pick lines tool. This is a great tool. And I'm just going to go around the boundary of the house. And it doesn't matter if they um, don't all join. Oops. Well, they do join there, so that's helpful. And I'll just say, okay. Oh, no, something's not joined there. So I'll just use my trim tool, TR for trim. Okay, there we go. And so you end up with something like that. What I can do as well is I can edit the boundary and what I might do is select those lines and change them to, let's change them to an invisible line and go like that. So that's how it looks. So we don't, um, essentially we don't go over the top of the black line that's already there. So that's one but I can click on that and I can edit it. So for instance, I'm gonna make that even lighter. I'm gonna go 240, 240, 240. So be very light. Yep. And then I can click on that and say edit boundary and then I can use the pick lines tool and then keep going with our other neighboring properties. And this replaces the hatch that we had originally that came in as like a solid gray. like so. All right. And I'll complete that shortly. And then um, we are working at one to 200. So make note of that because if I change the size of the scale, watch the text, the text automatically readjusts. So it makes it much smaller, but we are working at one to 200. So that's different in Revit compared to AutoCAD. The text is annotative. It will dynamically respond to whatever size that you're currently using. Now um, we can add, we've, we've done a lot of work here. So we should save this as a view template. So I'm gonna to go to uh, view and then view templates and create view template from this current view. And then I'm just gonna call this one, uh, one to one 200 underscore site plan and go okay. 
and say save and then I'll apply this to this view and there it is there 1 to 200 site plan and that's it saved in fact I'm just going to change I'm going to change that name I'm going to say 1-200 cool all right, so that's now safe. So if I go visibility graphics, all this will be grayed out because it's a, it's a view template, including even my import settings. So I need to make sure I go my um, view template, then adjust. But I am doing this so it is much easier on your next project. You just have to click this button once and adjust your next project. You're not going to have to go through this process um, again and again. And, ag and the other thing to keep in mind is that this site plan is by miles not complete. Um, we'll continue to add more information to this uh, as appropriate as you go along in your um, working drawings class. I'm going to add this drawing now to my cover sheet. So I'm going to click and drag and place that there. And that looks pretty good. And I get the feeling that we're probably going to need more sheets for our drawing set um, as we go along. But again, we'll respond to that in time. We don't have to worry about that too much now. But uh, that's how we get um, the beginnings of our site plan. Let's move on and take a look at our sections and details a little closer. So I'm going to go back to our ground floor plan and immediately you're going to notice we have property boundaries here. Again, this will happen throughout the entire assignment. I fully expect you to, to continue seeing stuff like this where items that we weren't using previously will end up showing up in views that you didn't expect because at the time they weren't uh, considered in the view template, but it's all good. So I'm going to go back to our view template and go to model categories, site, and turn off my property boundary, property lines, untick, okay, okay. And the good thing about this is because we are using view templates, don't have to worry about it on the first floor as well. One other item while we're on the first floor, I'm just gonna do a little bit of editing to show us our ridge lines in plan. I'm gonna go um, view range and temporarily, I'm just going to change this to uh, unlimited. So the top range will be unlimited and the cut range will be like 15,000. All right, and I'll say okay. And what will happen is we can now see the roof profile. So I'm going to click on the roof and then I am going to go um, HI to isolate. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a tool in the modify panel, which is very helpful called paint lines. So I click on modify and then, um, or line work, sorry. Then I go to view and this little button here, which is called line work or LW for short. When I click on that, it gives me the ability to essentially paint a line over the top of these lines here. So for instance, I'm going to choose um, the dashed. Well, let's just see what the hidden line, what does hidden line look like? Yeah, uh, let's just see what dash looks like. Yeah, I think the dash lines are better. So I pick dash 0 0.1. And then what I do is essentially I pick the lines that I want to, to draw over. So I pick this line, this one here, and I just go around the boundary of the roof. Okay. And then what I'll do is I'll just hover over the ridge lines as well. So I'll paint those up. They turn into dash lines. And what's good about this technique is that the, we're taking these lines from the model. So if the roof was to change, these dash lines would update. So I'll go HR to bring everything back. Looks like this. I'll go back to my view range and change this back to associated level and the cut range at 1200. Looks like this. But you'll notice now the dash lines for the roof are still showing. Okay, like so. And that's because um, they've taken from the actual roof line. Just note that when you hover over here, you're most likely going to continue selecting the roof from now on. So just double double H to height to temporarily hide it, and then work away on your floor plan. But keep that in mind. But what that does mean is if the, like if the roof profile was to change, those sketch lines would also update. So it's not like um, they're not like um, just detail lines, dummy detail lines that don't mean anything. Okay, so let's go to our section, double click, and much like our site plan um, and 
pretty much with all of these drawings, I'm showing you the methodology of how to do this within Revit, but the what to draw, like how to detail this or in terms of what exactly you're detailing and what uh, annotations to put on, um, what size materials and structural members you're using that you'll be referring to in your working drawings class. But we can take a few cues from here just to begin with and then you'll notice as um, these classes progress my details and my elevation sections my drawings in general will continue to become more detailed and update as the semester goes along um, and it won't have anything to do with what I've been delivering to you guys it will just be that I'm following along or um, developing these drawings in the background so let's just take a quick look at a few little things here even within the section so to tag our rooms, I'm just going to go RT on the keyboard and then it's, Revit's going to prompt me to say rooms are not currently visible in this view. Would you like to make them visible? Yes, please. You'll see the blue boxes. They're the different rooms and I can now just go around and click on these areas. So I'll go like that. That's our powder room, walk-in pantry. That's a walk-in robe there that we're cutting through the lobby. That's still the lobby and walk-in robe and I can hit escape okay but one thing you would have noticed is that when I was hovering over those rooms they're sitting pretty tall so where do we go there they are so they're sitting pretty tall so I should change this so I'm going to right click and go select all instances Ooh, I can't do that here that's all right I'll go back to my ground floor and I'm going to just do something like this and then go filter check none find my rooms, adjust my rooms, say okay. And then in the properties window, we can adjust that. So they start at the ground floor and the offset limit is 2.7 is our ceiling. And now that's updated. So when I go back to the section, hover over these rooms, we can see if I can get one. There we go. You'll see now that they're up to the ceiling height. So they're giving us um, correct volumes. All right, and then same with the first floor. So select everything, filter, check none, rooms, okay, and limit offset 2.7. Excellent. All right, so back to the section. We've got our room names now done. Okay. Um, Next up, let's tag these stairs. So another cool tool in Revit that will do tagging for you is under annotate. Um, underneath the tag profile, you've got room tag, space tag. Um, we've been tagging by category, multi-tag, material tag, and then you have tread number. So I click on that, just click on the stair and bang, it will just number your treads for you much quicker. Continuing on, let's talk about um, uh, our view itself. So if I go to the section details cover sheet, uh, sh sorry, um, drawing sheet, notice the drawings like this because we, in the last class we chucked our uh, model up higher to meet our topography. So I'm just going to double click in this view, turn on my crop region, which is down here, drag this up, drag that up. I'll drag these inwards like so and then click on this one here to actually crop the view. Double click out, I'll drag this view back down. I gotta grab my view name, drag that up. I was being very quick and crude here. I'll clean this up as we need to. And probably even leave that a bit further up and then turn off that. Okay, it looks much cleaner. All right, so next up is let's just take a look at detailing within Revit and how you would go about doing that. So I'm going to go to my view uh, view tab and then in the create panel in the ribbon, I'm going to click on call out and then the rectangle call out. I'm going to go to my type property selector and make sure I don't use a building section, but I want this to be an independent detail view. And then um, the actual details that you pick will be discussed in your working drawings class, but I'm just going to pick a couple here generically just to show you how they work. So I'm going to go one in this, con in this detail junction here. I'll do another one. Uh, and I'll go down here around the brick veneer. And I'll probably do another one around here. There'll be quite a few actually for this building. There's quite a few different junctions. So we'll leave it at that to begin with. 
But when I click on the uh, the body or the reference, you'll see that um, the name is down here in the um, properties window. So at the moment, that's called detail zero. And if we look in our project browser, I now have this thing underneath sections. I've got detail views. If I click the drop down box, I can see detail zero, one, and two. So I can assume that's zero, that's one, and that's two. I can, like with other views, I can either rename them here and they'll change here, or I can right click in the project browser, rename them here, and they'll update over here in the properties window. Everything's bi directional, which um, at the moment uh, I might just call this one. Um, roof wall ceiling junction and this one will be parapet and this one would be floor wall okay and you can see they've updated in the detail view we may i may update those names at a later later stage so to go into that view i just double click on the head itself and now we're in that detail view and at the moment, this is a scale of 1 to 25, but I could change that to 1 to 10, 1 to 20, and so on and so forth. And at the moment, um, there's not a lot of detail that's given here for us. And so that we have to discuss whether we're going to utilize, um, whether we're going to utilize detail groups or detail components and how they work. So under the annotate tab, we have our detail lines. So when I click on detail lines, the first thing you think about is like, okay, how do I draw like a timber stud here? I can just go and find like a pen three, five, draw a box like that, and then use two um, lines for my crosshairs. And that's like a timber stud. And I can like take that and I can move that around and that's fine. Or what I can do is I can use a detail group. So I can select them and say, actually, I want to make this a um, detail group. I give that a name. I can call it 90 by 45 timber stud. And then now that's a group. So I can uh, just drag this around. All selects is one. Um, and it's all pretty easy. And if I want to change it, I double click on it. And I just update its size, let's say. Just like that. Say, okay. And now they update. And any other one that's around. So let's say here I clean this up. Go OK, and the other one updates too. Now, problem with this is that this is a really slow way to work and you can't add parameters uh, and it ends up um, just being very poor model quality. The other thing to consider too is that as we're hovering these over, they're not blocking anything out. In other words, I can see the roof behind the block and that's not really going to work. So what we're going to do is we're going to digress uh, shortly and we're going to go into the... Um, family editor and make our first detail component which we can then bring back in here and we'll use some parameters um, add some parametric parameters to it um, so we can utilize it for all different uh, block sizes I'm going to go up to file new and then family and I'm going to select um, metric detail item and click OK and this is kind of like a block editor. So it just opens up basically a CAD view with two reference planes, nothing else. First thing we're going to do is use some more reference planes. So RP for reference planes. I'm just going to go one more there and one more there. Okay. Then I'm going to use my dimension tool and just dimension these up quickly like so. But I, what I'm going to do now is click on the dimension and then under here where it says label, I've got this little button here with a little sun. I can add a parameter. So when I click on that, we can say, well, let's give this a, a width and a, and a height. So in here, I'm going to call this width and whether it's type base or instance base, um, we're going to leave this as a type base parameter for now. I'll explain this a little bit more in greater detail when we get into family creation. So I'll leave it like that. And then this one will make another one and we'll call this one height and say okay all right next up i'm going to go into this little box here um, this family types uh, button with the four little blue boxes 
and that's going to bring this up and we can change this from here we can flex the family using this so i can say that's uh the height is 45 mil and the width is 90 so 90 by 45 timber stud click ok and those reference planes update. So parameters are driven by reference planes, not exactly, it's not actually driven by the geometry. The geometry is just locked to the reference planes. So I'm gonna go up to create and then click on masking region. And I'm going to use, uh, let's use medium lines. Let's see how that works. I'm gonna grab a rectangle and I'm purposely just gonna draw away from that shape. So it looks something like this. And then I'm going to grab my line tool, so AL, then click on one of the reference planes, click on one of the detail lines, and then hit the little padlock, and then do the same thing here, reference plane, line, padlock, reference plane, line, padlock. And the reason why we're doing that is because the padlock means that wherever the reference planes go, the masking region follows with it. That's how you'll get it to, to shape to different sizes. Click the OK tip box, and then we're going to go back to create, and then click on line. I'm just going to grab uh, a thin line, light lines, and I'm just going to go from one corner to another, one corner to another. That's now done. So I'm going to go back up to File, Save As, Family. I'll find today's class, which is here. And I'm just going to go um, DC, Detail Component, underscore Timber Stud. All right, and say OK. That's now done. So I'm going to go load into project and close. OK, and I've got this here, but this is not really going to help in this view. So I'm going to just go back to my section um, and we'll double click on that view just here. So while I'm in this view here, I can go up to uh, annotate and then component and then detail component. And then there's my timber stud. So I can put that in this corner right here and I can have a double top plate. And if that doesn't quite line up, I can just do that and then move that. So it looks like that. So that's how I get my timber stud. And then notice that if I was to place it up around here, it blacks out or whites out anything in the background. The other thing I can do is we can change its size. So this at the moment is just called um, detail component underscore timber stud. We can go edit type and we can make new ones. So in this type, I might call this one. So rename this and I'm going to call it 90 by 45 mil. And then we'll say duplicate. And this one will be called, um, let's say 90 by 35 millimeter. And then I just have to change 45 to 35 and then click OK. And so what you'll see now is I can click on this one, it says 90 by 35, click on this one, it says 90 by 45, and let's do one more. I'll go again, duplicate, and let's say we'll do a uh, 120 by 45. Okay, and I'll change that back to 45, change that to 120, say OK, and that now updates. And now this one's still 90 by 45. That one's 120 by 45. In fact, I think it should be 35. So I'll just change that. Okay. But when I click on that detail component and click on the type selector, you'll see now underneath DC timber stud, you've got 90 by 35, 90 by 45, and 120 by 35. And you can make unlimited sizes that you want. The other thing too is that you can always just flip these around. If you just hit spacebar, they'll flick around on an axis so it's easy to um, rotate these around. You can still rotate them normally, but that just works a little bit easier. So take for instance our ceiling battens. I could copy this across. This depth here, because this is our ceiling right here. So that's our, we're looking at this in detail. So that's our plasterboard. And then that's our area for our studs. So I think that's a 90 by 35. So I'll pick that. And you'll see now they've just fit into place. I might just put one there just for argument's sake like that. Okay. Now as for um, like sarking or whatnot, I just use a detail line. So DL and I just pick a um, dash line. So again, I might pick a thick dash line and I'm just going to go somewhere around here and do something like that. Mm, that's probably too thick. I'll go to pen 2.5. 
something like that. And then for insulation, Revit has a really cool tool which already does it for you. So there's an insulation line here and you just type in the width of that insulation. So I'll say it's uh, 90 mil and I just draw from this center point, just drag down, how easy is that? And already we can see this is starting to look a lot better in terms of detail. Um, as for our trusses, we can do that uh, in a little bit, but um, for um, stuff like ceiling, um, ceiling cornices and floor cornices, we'll go through that in a later class using the sweep tool. So we'll actually model those up or we'll try, we'll do a bit of both. Um, then what we have is our gutter profile. Now, gutter profile looks a little bit strange because what we're seeing is the gutter profile cut and then also the profile turn around the corner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn change the far clip offset in here. So the far clip offset, I'm going to say um, the far clip settings are not the same as the parent. And when you see that, what that means is that the depth of this um, section or this detail is the same as the section. So I can say, actually, you know what? I want to control this view independently. So I can say independent, and then you'll see in here now, I can change that number. So I can say, well, only just show me beyond the cut line, maybe, uh, I don't know, let's say um, 300 mil. And that's what that will look like now. So that's a cool. That's much better too, because we don't see the underside of the roof. And now we just see the profile of the gutter, which is much more realistic. Now, let's just say, for instance, that you've got anything, I'll just change that back to being further back like that. If you have anything like this where you've got a pattern in the background that's sort of annoying you a little bit, what you can um, do is you can use the masking region as kind of like a drawing tool. So if I use masking region, and let's say I wanna draw like, a, um, like a, um, a top chord of a truss, I can just use my pen 1.8 and I'm just going to trace over this wall and I'm just sort of uh, drawing this in quick time, so it's not accurate at all. I'm just sort of sketching away. Do something like that and then click OK. And then that's what it does. It will sort of cover over what's currently there. Not saying that we have to in this instance because we're gonna bring that cut plane back, that far offset, um, far clip. Um, but nonetheless, that's how you would do it. You use a mixture of um, masking regions, detail lines and detail components or detail items. I'm going to change that back to say 300 okay and that looks good now in terms of annotations i'm going to go over to my text and i'm just going to use arial 1.8 and let's what i've got here is under the leader structure i've got just text is which is what we were using before something like that i then have text with one um sort of one break in the arrow so that's if i wanted to go like uh like this Okay, then I have the ability to use like a two L, like a two, um, what do they call it? Like two segment leader. So I can go like that. I might just delete that, but I can always move these afterwards just by grabbing the grips and moving them around. And then I can move these around as well. And Revit's pretty smart in that it will pick up on another annotation and will help you align that annotation. So we'll continue to fill these out as we go along um, and add more detail and annotation to them and also add in some more structure, um, some of the detail around our, trussing, um, our truss structure as well. Looking at that uh, detail a little bit further, I've been just been working away on it. So what I've done is added uh, detail lines. So these are all detail lines, including the sarking, which is just a dash detail line. Added some more, uh, I got my ceiling battens up here using our um, timber stud family. Some more insulation along here, another line along there. What I have done is I've actually hidden the roof and I've brought in um, a tile family that you can get in the standard library which I'll show you in a second. I've got my tile battens, which are just 30 by 30, 35 by 35 timber studs, which um, come from that same family again. So that's another new type. You can see now we've got four different types in there. And then these families themselves, where they came from is under um, the annotate tab and in the detail ribbon, I click on component, detail component, and then load family. And then within here, if you go to um, the Australian library, then go to detail items, then come down to, uh, where is it? Um, it was under, 
Yep, thermal and moisture protection, and then roof tile. You'll see in here is a bunch of like um, standard detail component tiles. So what I did is I chose one of these just as a generic. I chose um, the double pan left hand side or right hand side really didn't matter. Then open that family up. And then what I did is inside of that family, which looks like this, I did a little bit of editing. So I took away one of those lines because it looked a little bit too tall. And then what I did is I made these thicker lines here because this is the part of the tile that's actually been cut through. And then this is the tile that's in projection behind the tile as it sort of ridges up, if you know what I mean. And then I inserted that into our drawing and then just mirrored it and rotated it into place and then put it together. And so that's what we're looking at at the moment in a preliminary fashion. So notice that the roof is actually gone. If I show you where the roof is, there it is back there. But I've hidden that in the view. Um, because we don't want to see that. Um, of course, we don't model individual tiles, but when we get down to this level, we want to see the tile like that. So I've just hidden that in um, view. Um, and then moving on to some of our other ones. So let's take the parapet detail. Here's our parapet wall. I'm going to change that to 1 to 10 as well. And uh, I'm just going to quickly move these walls. So firstly, the parapet wall should probably be much higher than this. The top offset at the moment, it's going up to level one. But what I'm going to do is go to my 3D view and then click on this wall here. And I'm going to click on, mm, well, we'll just start with this wall. And I'm going to change the top constraint from being level, well, it can stay as level one, but the top offset, I'll give it another, say, uh, 300 mil. Mm, probably doesn't even need to be that high, even 150 mil. Yeah, that's okay. And then this wall here, what I'm going to have to do is split this wall. So, um, so because I want to raise this part, but not this part. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go SL on my keyboard and then just click anywhere on this wall and I'm going to get this sort of break here. And what I can do is I can change the location of that break just by using this. Okay, just clicking one of the drag lines. So, oh, that hasn't worked. I'm going to go to my floor plan do it. It's probably just much easier. Go to my floor plan, go SL on my keyboard, and then I'm just going to split it right here. Okay, so it looks like that. And now what I can do is go back to my 3D view, click on this wall, and I can make that higher now. I can give that the offset of 150. for our wall there. Okay, and I actually just need to move that across. So I'll use my align tool. There we go, perfect. And then I'll do the same thing around the back. So I go ground floor. In fact, it's probably easier if I do it on the first floor. So there's my parapet, there's my wall. I'm just gonna go, there's my wall, SL right there perfect click on that portion of the wall and offset that up 150 and so what that looks like in 3d looks something like this so this wall sort of sits up higher before it ta ta tapers back down and likewise here because we've got our first floor um, facade but it means now that our gutter is encapsulated now i know the gutter needs to be wider than this this is i think only 100 mil wide it needs to be 150 so what we're going to do is I'm going to go into my families in the project browser, um, go down to, I want to go down to profiles, double click, and then this is easy because we've been working on this. So um, PR gutter 150 by 75, right click, say rename, or edit type, my mistake. So I'm just going to come into here. And actually, I want this to be 200, sorry, not 100. So I'm just going to move this out by 50. So we end up with something that looks like this. And I'll go load into project. Yep, load it back into project. And then update the existing version. And now that gut is updated. But if I go back into my uh, new section, whoop, I'm losing a lot of drawings here. If this happens and I've got a lot of tabs showing up at the top of my screen, I just click on this button here. It says close inactive views. So it takes me back. So now the only view open in this project is this view that I have currently here. So I'm just going to go back to our section, parapet detail, sorry. And there's our new gutter. 
So I'm going to need to adjust the profile 50 mil back in order to work. So if I click on edit footprint, it's going to open up this go to view. So I can just click on say uh, level one is fine. Say open view and then it will open in sketch mode. And all I need to do is just take this wall, th take this line, use my move tool and just move that back 50 mil because we've added 50 mil to the gutter. I'll say, okay. And then if we go back to that parapet view, there we go. So that's a bit cleaner. So again, we'll work through this detail when it comes to it, but you understand now how to use the annotate tab in greater detail, both the detail components like detail lines, the fill region, masking region, detail components, um, going through detail groups, insulation, and also annotations. There are a multitude of ways to, to print and export uh, drawings via PDF or DWG or any format that you wish, but we're going to utilize pretty much just the bulk standard out of the box Revit printing mechanisms. So we've got a couple of sheets set up and we may just want to print these to PDF. It's more than likely 99% of the time when you print or batch plot from any um, authoring software, whether it be CAD, Revit or whatever, you normally want to go to a PDF first and then print the PDF from there. Most of the time because the PDF is the thing that you're sending, not actual physical prints. So um, regardless, even if I wanted to print these physically, I would still print them to PDF inside of Revit and then open those PDFs and then print those. So I've got these sheets here. The, general, the cover sheet's got our site plan. The GAs are looking okay. Building elevations are still cooked. I haven't fixed those. And the section is, um, is sort of coming along. So we've got something there. So we can do a dip, bit of a test print at this point. So you can either go up to file um, and print um, or you can just go control P on your keyboard all right, and so I have my um, blue beam PDF printer set up um, by default, but you know yours you might have in here Adobe PDF, Qt PDF, um, PDF24. You could have Microsoft Print to PDF. I mean, any of them are going to do the job. I just use a blue beam by default. Under that, you've got um, the ability to combine uh, multiple selected sheets and views into a single file, or whether you would like to create individual files for each of the sheets. There's a bit of a difference in methodology here between commercial and residential. Um, I think tenden, uh, typically with residential, you would normally just batch plot them and um, stick them as one PDF. Uh, whether in commercial, you generally will plot each sheet individually as an individual file, just because you might have you know 300 drawings and you might have um, got a new revision on one of the drawings. You don't need to print the other 299. So you would do them as individual files. but in this instance, being a smaller project, we'll just do it as one combined file. Under that, you've got um, the location where this will save. So I'm just going to save this. I'll save it to today's class. That's fine. Um, but you could direct it to your you know, um, outgoing um, folder, transmission folder, um, whatever it may be. Then under that, you have the print range. So what is actually going to be printed? You've got the current window, which essentially is code for this sheet only. Under that, you have the visible portion of the current window, which would mean if I was like zoomed in on a certain area and I click that, it will just print essentially what's on my computer screen, like whatever is currently showing on my computer screen. And then under that, you've got select sheets and views, which is the one we're going to utilize. So then you click on select and you've got all of the views and all of the sheets that are currently in the project. And we can filter these out um, immediately by going down here and saying, just show me the sheets do not show me the views. So here's our sheets. And I'm going to go one, two, I'm going to skip the elevations and do um, the sections in detail. So I've got three sheets in total. So you can pick all of them, you can pick some of them, and then you can save them as well. So you can say, well, I want to set this as a, as a, as a printer set. So when you come in here next time, you can just click on this drop down box and you can choose which set you want. Again, this makes sense because if you've got a bigger drawing, maybe you just want to print elevations. Maybe you just want to print general arrangement floor plans or just um, sections or something like that. So you can set up those um, sets um, predeterminately. But for now, I'm just going to leave this as the in session and I've just selected those three sheets. I'm then gonna, I'm then going to click OK. Would I like to um, save this settings for a future Revit session? Nah, that's okay right now. Then we'll click on the setup. So under setup is where we get our page setup going. So this is currently an A2 title block. So I need to change this page size to be ISO A2. 
and then you've got the placement of the drawing. I'm going to keep it at the center of the screen and then the um, the zoom. So it's not fit to page. It's actually going to be a zoom of 100%. This is how you know the drawings are going to print to scale. Under that, you've got the different options, whether you want to see uh, links, hide um, reference planes, yes. Um, hide scope boxes, yep. Hide the crop boundaries, yes. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff there, but by default should be fine. Then you have the orientation. Of course, we want landscape. Under that is whether we want vector or raster um, processing. Think back to Photoshop as a raster program. Um, PDFs are vector based, so we'll leave it as that. The appearance is, um, I'm going to leave as presentation and it's going to be done in color. So that's good to go. I will then say OK. And then I'm just going to click OK. And it says, you have chosen to print three separate sheets as separate files. Do you wish to continue? No, I don't. I want to change this back to combined and then say OK. And now that's done. So it's just going to run through its printing um, process. And then I don't know. Okay, yep. So with Bluebeam, it will prompt me to save it somewhere. So I'm just going to save this here. And I'll just call this test underscore. And hit OK. Now Bluebeam is printing that. And I'm sure it's going to open, which it has. And here it is here. So, and you can see these lines look a heck of a lot better once they're printed compared to how they look in Revit. And it prints in color too. So that's a big component as well that I'm not sure whether residential does it as much, but in commercial colors are utilized a lot, uh, whether it's for like different, uh, typically it's used a heck of a lot in like um, uh, engineering. So the difference between uh, electrical engineers, hydraulic engineers, plumbing, um, um, HVAC engineers, and then even in architecture, you'll have, it's very common to have a set of floor plans where walls are red, walls are blue, walls are green, and they'll denote like different fire ratings, different acoustic ratings and whatnot. You really should utilize the color settings um, within Revit, um, not like traditional, say, AutoCAD, where things are usually just plotted in black and white. But this is a good example of sort of how we're going at this point. It's still early days, there's still a lot to go through but the result looks pretty good so far. So that is how we um, print inside of uh, Revit. Now, if I ever wanted to export these as DWG drawings, I could just go up to file and then export and then click on DWG and then click DWG here. And then I have the ability to then just take this current sheet or choose a sheet set Okay, which is where having those sheet sets help. And then I can say next and then save that out as a DWG file. So if I click OK, I'll just do that. All right, now that's done. So I can go to my file explorer and I'll open up today's class. There's our two story dwelling cover sheet. I can open that up inside of AutoCAD. So I go to my model. Okay, and there's my Revit file there. So it exports out as um, 2D Revit drawings, pretty much as blocks and groups, but it does help, especially when you're trying to do coordination with other consultants, it's pretty typical. Um, you can export out um, 3D DWGs. That's something that we'll look at doing um, in term four when we start going through interoperability with other software such as um, Rhino and, um, uh, and going back and forward bi-directionally between those two softwares.